Hi everyone and welcome to our online YouTube platform. I really hope that you find a place here. We are starting a new sermon series called Road Trip and Ruthie will share about that in our message today and the destination. I'm not going to get in too much, take it away. It's so great to be with you today and uh, I trust that as we start this brand new series that you would really be blessed and pulled into this extraordinary adventure and life that God has for us. Starting a brand new series this week called Road Trip. Road Trip. Now, I don't know about you, but I love a good road trip. My wife is the master chef when it comes to road trip snacks. She has the whole spread. I'm not going to say it's all healthy. But we love it. You know, the moment those wheels start turning, myself and the kids are like, Mommy, do you have something to eat for me? It's not about the road. It's about the snacks. Um, another thing that we love doing on a road trip is we, we all take turns to choose songs that we actually want to listen to. So I'll choose this song and my daughter who's four years old chooses that song and this song and we all sing along and it's this great fun trip. I don't know what you do for road trips. But normally, it's supposed to be a lot of fun, and it's an adventure. But it's not about the snacks, uh, as important as that is. A road trip probably has to do with three essentials. Uh, firstly, who's with you in the car? Uh, who's going with you? If you're a teenager, you're probably saying, man, I wish I could go on this road trip alone. I don't want to have my brother or my sister with me. Just leave me alone. And it's important who's with you in the car. It's also important to know where you're going to stop along the way and who you might meet along the way. But ultimately, a road trip is not a road trip unless you have a clear destination. And today we're going to jump into the destination. And discipleship, which is the core of who we are as a church, discipleship is a journey almost like a road trip we're on, where it's important who's with us on this trip. Who do we meet along the way? Where do we stop along this way? And then very importantly, what is our destination? And maybe you've asked this question. So what is the destination of discipleship? What is the destination of Christianity? Maybe your first answer would be heaven, of course. That is our destination. We're on this trip going to heaven. But the interesting thing is if it's about heaven... Um, and maybe that's how you got saved. Somebody asked you the question, if you would die today, where are you going to be? And you said, well, I'm not sure. And you gave your life to Jesus. Uh, then heaven is your destination. But that's not the whole story. You see, we call this a conversion gospel. Where it's like you are drowning. And if somebody says, hey, do you want to grab my hand? Of course, grab my hand and pull me out. But... I'm not just pulled out of the water to be saved or to get to heaven. There must be more to this. There must be a life also after this beautiful knowledge, as important as it is. The destination of Christianity, where it's just about heaven or hell, is almost like a get uh, out of jail free card. I just don't want to go to hell. But friends, there's so much more to this. And unfortunately, that type of thinking has produced in many ways, let's call it shallow Christianity, where I've made a decision on a camp or at a service or at some event, and I said yes to Jesus, and He in His grace saves me, but then no life change happens, and we kind of just hang on till we get to the destination, heaven, but friends, it's a lot more than that. I believe heaven is the result of Christianity. It's not necessarily the destination. We are going to get to heaven with Christ and being with Him. But the question is then, if it's not the destination, and the, but it's the result, what then is the destination? Now, in our church, we believe in discipleship. We call ourselves, as every nation, a disciple-making family. And every time I make disciples, I pull out a little one-to-one -one booklet. That's the book that we use in our discipleship. And I always start, as we teach all our people, start with the verse that sets up the purpose of our group, but also that shows us actually 
what is the destination of the Christian life. And that's in Mark 1, verse 17, where Jesus said to them, a bunch of fishermen, he said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. So I believe that the destination on this road trip is not heaven. That's the result. I believe our destination is becoming more like Jesus. That is our core destination. It's a becoming. How do we get there? How do we become more like him? Well, we do what this verse says. We follow him. And that's why the first essential relationship on this road trip is a relationship with Jesus. Every time that I've discipled people, when I've gone to this verse, there's a lot of words that pop out. The word follow pops out. The word make, fishes of men. But for me personally, the most important verse, word in this verse is that little word, me. Come follow me, Jesus said. It is so personal. Uh, I've almost uh, been following Jesus for um, 31 years. And it's never about a bunch of rules or religious do's and don'ts, tick boxes. For me, it's always been a personal journey, walking and following in the dust of my master. As you would be walking behind somebody on a trail or following somebody on a road trip. It's always been personal. Can I ask you today, do you know him as a personal savior, as a personal leader, and you are the apprentice, you are the disciple following him? Because everything else will fail in due course. You can only keep up religion for so long that it tires you out. You can only copy what other Christians are doing, other followers are doing. Uh, it can only last that long. But if it's personal and if you are following a person, it changes everything. Now, um, we as a family and we as a church family, if you're in this church family, you know that we've had a, a, a kind of a tough year. A bunch of things have has happened to us. We're out of a venue and the inconvenience of 11 o'clock service. Many of our people have gone through terrible trials and tribulations. Uh, people are losing loved ones, houses burning down, um, people close to them getting hurt or leaving. Um, and in, in the last couple of weeks, um, even us as a church and myself have been subjected to some false accusations, even in newspapers and, and stuff like that happened. Um, and we're still uncertain about the future um, of where are we going to find a more permanent venue with everything that's currently going on in the news regarding Wiskovart, the clue of we're trusting, we're praying for favor and for, for God's door to still open for us there in the year of 2025. But those things happen to us. Do you know that bad things also happen to followers of Jesus? And... If our destination is just heaven, we're like, oh, I just want to close my eyes and hope everything goes away till I get to heaven one day. But if my destination is I want to become more like Jesus, then these difficult moments become catalysts and ways that God sovereignly uses to make us more like him. In this time, I text some of my friends and um, and I told him, listen, whatever they said about me falsely in the newspapers, it's okay with me because many years ago, I decided to follow Jesus. And following Jesus also means Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. It's not about me. It's not. So whatever God wants to use to kill and let me die to myself, to my sinful all that are deep, so that I can become more like Jesus, kudos, let's go for that. Let's embrace that. And maybe you've been kicking against the goats and the things that God tries in your life to shape you, to, to make you more like him, 
you've tried to resist. In many ways, the discipleship is, is, is about killing people. <laughs> it's about calling people to die to themselves. Because this unholy trinity inside of me, that me, myself, and I, needs to get out of the way so that I can choose the Jesus way. And in this time, a song of Phil Wickham meant so much to me. It says, if you curse me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will forgive. If you hate me, then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. If you strike me, I will embrace you. And if you chain me, I'll sing his praise. And if you kill me, my home is heaven, for I choose the Jesus way. I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. He wore my sin. I'll gladly wear his name. He is the treasure. He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. And on this destination, on this road trip, to become more like him is a daily choice to follow him, to be a disciple, really be following him. And then the natural result, Jesus promises, is that I will also make disciples. And this is what we are all about, every nation, being disciples and making disciples, being disciples and making disciples. Now, the word disciple is a word used even more in the Bible than the word Christian. The word Christian you won't find there. You will rather see things like followers of the way. We are followers of the Jesus way. We are disciples who walk in the dust of our master. And if you would follow me, Ratif, for a couple of days or a month, you'll start to see what I like. How do I rest? What do I watch on TV? What sport? What hobbies? And maybe in due time, you'll start to like the food that I like. You start to do the things that I do, as my kids hopefully does at my house. You see, you can't follow somebody closely and not become like them in due time. The same with Jesus. If we don't become more like the one we're following, then the question would be, are we really following the real Jesus? It will rub off. He is so contagious. He is so amazing. He's so gorgeous, beautiful, strong, awesome, that the more I'm with him, the more I follow him, the more I want to become like him. And that, friends, is our destination. That is the calling that God has for us. You see, we all are following something in this world. Some are following fame, money, a career. And as Psalm 115 says, that these idols we are following, people actually become like those things that they idolize, that they worship, that they follow. You cannot follow two things at the same time. Have you tried men to follow the rugby while your wife is trying to talk to you? You can't do that. Or try to follow her while you're watching the rugby. No, you have to choose. And for some of you, you've been sitting on the fence far too long. And God is saying, what will you choose? Will you really choose to follow me wholeheartedly, all in? And that is the choice of this destination so that we can become more and more like him. And I want to take you to an amazing passage in Luke 5, which will be our core text for today. And it's also an addition where Jesus is calling the fishermen to come and follow me. It's in Luke 5, verse 1 to 11. Let's read together. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Verse 4, And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. 
they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching me. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. What an amazing account. If you've seen The Chosen, the, the series, this was depicted in such a profound way. Go and watch it. Where these fishermen, done fishing for the night, failed cleaning up. And Jesus then using this opportunity to change and to rock their world in such a way that this last verse says that they left everything and they followed him. What happened that that would be their response? And I trust that as I go through this, something will pull in your heart to say, Lord, I will be willing to leave everything to follow you on this road trip to become more like you. Verse 2 and 3, we see that there were two boats by the lake. The fishermen had gone out. They were washing their nets. And, and then getting into one of the boats, Jesus starts to speak and start to teach. Now, just picture yourself um, washing their nets, um, maybe mending some of the broken parts, um, frustrated, distraught, um, and then suddenly Jesus gets into this boat. Have you ever been in a place where you're like, something is over, you're done, you're packing up, there's no more hope, there's no more future, and then Jesus suddenly pitches up. Yeah, he gets into the boat. You see, Jesus has the ability to take what seemed like a failure and in a moment, he turns it around in our lives. But he has to get into our boats. Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior fully? That he can get into your boat. And I know many times we have these excuses of, Lord, look at my boat. Look at my life. It's messed up. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too broken. Um, why would you want to deem my boat, my life, worthy enough to come into my life. And we have all these excuses and all these reasons, but it had nothing to do with the boat. It had to do with who got into the boat. And that's the amazing thing that happens in our lives, where God has the ability to just take control and he steps into our lives and he starts to call the shots exactly as it happened here in verse 4 and 5. He not only speaks to the crowd, but now suddenly he turns to the owner of the boat, Simon, and that's Simon Peter. And he says, go out into the deep, pull out, put out to the deep, and let down your nets for a catch. And then Simon answers, Master, we've toiled all night, and we took nothing. I, I just imagine being Peter like he's tired, he's just want to go home, want to go and sleep, want to go and eat something. And here's this strange rabbi, and he probably said, hey, listen, I am the experienced fisherman around here. I know we've done everything we could with all our lives experience. And yet he then says these words. He says, we took nothing but at your word, I will let down the nets. And right there, even before he followed Jesus, he obeyed his words in a moment. You see, following Jesus comes back to Lordship. He is the Lord, and we have a choice. Are we going to obey or not? Peter had a choice to say, yeah, let's, let's trust this master's word, which he did. Or he could have said, no, thank you, we're out. You could borrow my boat for your cool speech, but no, we're out, we're bailing out. But he chose surrender. 
he chose to relinquish control. You see, when Jesus gets into our boat, we can still try and be in control. We can still try and say, like, you're in my life. I've accepted you as my Lord and my Savior, but I like the Savior part more than the Lord part because Lord demands obedience. Yes, Lord. You can't say any other word before the word Lord. It's only yes, Lord. He made a choice. You see, following Jesus is a choice, not something we are born into. We choose it daily. It doesn't just come naturally. It, it's almost like counterintuitive. This destination of becoming more like Jesus, following him, choosing him, goes against my old sinful nature because I want to do what I want to do. We want to choose our comfort. We want to choose our will, which we think is the better way. I don't know about you, but it's sometimes difficult for me to obey and to follow Jesus. Because I actually do think I know better. I've got the experience, Lord. I've got the... And then he just says, well, it's your choice. And then I come to those moments where I say, Lord, I don't understand this, but at your word, I will do it again. You know, it's so amazing. Actually, Jesus takes them back to the place that they failed. He sends them back to their failure, into the deep water. When my wife and myself came together, we were friends for 20 years. And then, lo and behold, we came together and we became like a couple. And within two weeks, I ran. I ran. I bailed out. Because I failed so many times in relationships. And I was always looking for the perfect one. That perfect catch <laughs> in this analogy. And I ran. And for another six months, I ran. And I kept running into Jesus and him telling me, Hey, get back in the boat and go back. Face your fears. Face your failures. And by the grace of God, six months later, I did. Worked through it, got married three kids later, 10 years <laughs> from that date. Or you may be running away from all your failures. Uh, you keep on running from one church to another. You keep on running from one relationship, one job to another. And Jesus in your boat is actually telling you, hey, I want you to go back. And I've seen so many people in counseling, seen so many people in counseling, especially people who got hurt in relationships, because that's normally what we need counseling for. And as great as it is, and how amazing myself, God has given me things in counseling, my true healing only came when I went back into relationships. When people go back into church, go back into business, whatever that is, go back and lower your nets again. Maybe you need to stop running. I know it's tough to work through things. But following Jesus is going wherever he goes, even if it means going back to your place of disappointment. And then he comes and he does a miracle. Look what happened in verse 6 and 7. When they had done this, they enclosed or caught such a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and they filled both the boats so that they began to sink. It says, and when they had done this, what did they do? They followed the command of Jesus to go out again, back to their failure, put down their nets. And it's amazing that by following and obeying Jesus, they caught the greatest catch of their lifetime. You see, following Jesus is obeying Jesus in those moments. If you want to become more like him, we need to follow him by obeying him. Obedience and not performance leads to miracles. Obedience and not performance leads to miracles. And the great thing is they share the miracles with others. And that's the great thing of the Christian walk. We're going to speak about that next week. We are not just on this road trip, on this destination of becoming like him alone. No, people are with us. They are witnessing and saying, hey, Retief, something is changing your life. And all that you could say is, I'm not sure exactly, but all I know is that Jesus did it. He gets all the glory. I have the privilege of 
sitting with people in connect groups and seeing transition and transformation happen in three months, in six months, in a year, where people, their old friends almost don't even physically recognize them because they've changed so much when Jesus changes them on the inside and others can share in the miracle. I look at this response then of Peter after the miracle, verse 8 to 9, when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. His response fascinated. All wonder, the fear of the Lord came on him in that moment. Two weeks ago, Dam Ivan shared on the fear of the Lord. And, and what an amazing verse in Psalm 25, verse 14. The fear of the Lord is reserved for those, or friendship with God, sorry, is reserved for those who fear him. Friendship, intimacy for those who have this awe, this fear, not being afraid of God, but having this awe, this fear of him. And the immediate response was, as he saw who this God is, he looked to himself and said, I'm a sinful man. That's the amazing thing that happens as we encounter Jesus as Lord. We start to compare his greatness to our lack of greatness. And it leads us to surrender and a dependency on him where we say, Lord, you must become more and I must become less. John 3 verse 30. You must increase and I must decrease. And listen, it's not a spiritual inferiority I'm talking about now. It's actually lifting Jesus so high that you understand what is your place. And then you understand you are nothing without him. But in him and with him, you are more than a conqueror. You are called a son and a daughter of the most high living God. And you find your true identity in your walk with him. Are you discovering how great he is? Is your response constantly, Lord, if it wasn't for you, I would have been in hell. I would have been lost. And your worship increases. It's amazing that the Apostle Paul, through his life, he, had, he made three massive statements. And if you go chronologically, the first statement, he said, I am the least of the apostles. Great, small group of people. I'm the least of them. Then, he said, I'm the least of all the saints. Bigger group. But at least both of them are like Christians, followers of Jesus, apostles and saints. Before he died, his revelation of who Jesus is and how utterly dependent he is on him grew so much that his last statement was, I am the chief of all sinners. To like, did this guy have a inferiority complex no he had a jesus complex because he saw how amazing wonderful this jesus is and he understood a humility came on him and he said if not for god i would have been no one you see coming close to somebody that is better than you in something or is an attribute that you aspire to it, it, it inspires you. It's almost like mesmerizing. It, it, it amazes us. And we want to become more like him. How much more with Jesus? And I love the response of Jesus. Jesus knows that following him helps us to see who we really are like and who he really is like. And he responds by saying, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. How amazing. He says, do not be afraid. Relax. And then he starts calling out the greatness in Peter. Simon at that point was just a fisherman. All these guys came and returned from that same shore as fishermen. But that day, they came as fishermen, and they left as world changers. They didn't know it yet, but Jesus saw something in them. He called out greatness. It was like a prophecy in the making where he said, 
from now on you will be catching. And this Simon, little rock, he said, you're going to be this Simon, this rock, and on the declaration that I am Jesus Christ the Lord, I will build my church. And he became a church leader. Even later on, he even denied Jesus with the rooster crowing. You remember that story? But still, God used him mightily because it wasn't about him and his boat and his life. It was the one who got into his boat about Jesus and how he transformed Peter. They left everything and they followed him. You see an encounter with the true living Jesus changes everything that we value in life so that they could leave everything. And do what? Follow him. Why did they leave that day? Well, they left their boats, for starters. They left their income and their livelihood. But yeah, if you've thought about it, they left the biggest catch of a lifetime right there on the shore. We have no idea what happened to the fish. But it says they left everything. So they most probably left the fish as well. They could have made a killing. Now, following Jesus doesn't mean necessarily that all of you need to be in vocational ministry. That's not what I'm trying to get to. But this is no more closet Christianity. It's no more, well, I follow Jesus. When somebody asks me to fill in a little form at school, yes, I'm a Christian. I'm not asking if you're a Christian. Are you a follower? And if you're a follower, are you becoming? Are you looking more and more like him? And it's a all in as it was with them. What is Jesus calling you to leave behind that is so precious to you that is your comfort or your control or even idols where he says, follow me, follow me. Because you see the encounter with Jesus in the boat and the miracle cannot just stay there. It needs to come back to the shore and change your whole life. Maybe it was a camp. Maybe it was a sermon. Maybe it was a church service where something has happened in your life. You saw the miracles, but the life change, the becoming more like him has not truly happened in your life. And would you today say, Lord, this encounter with you, I want to keep on having it daily. And daily I want to follow you. Daily I want to walk in your dust. Daily I want to be an apprentice of my master to leave everything and to follow you. How on earth, how on earth could they make that decision? Yes, it was a miracle. Yes, they saw a miracle, a supernatural miracle. But I think in that moment, it was something else that clicked. They saw that whatever they thought was valuable, then in comparison to this man, this God, man, this Jesus who was standing in front of him. That's why when Mark 1.17 says, follow me, I'm in trouble with that me, with that Jesus. I am in awe. I am mesmerized for the last 31 years. And I pray for the next 30 that I will just fall in love with him more and more and more and say, Lord, how can I get to know you more personally, intimately, so that whatever I need to leave behind isn't even a sacrifice because of the worth of you. And that's why Paul could say in Philippians 3, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Jesus explained the same concept that Paul went through, that Peter went through, that I trust you have gone through, or maybe today is that day where like, Lord, I want to count everything as rubbish. Jesus spoke about this in a parable also in Matthew 13. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, not moaning, not, oh, it's such a sacrifice. No, he goes in his joy, sells everything, and buys that field. 
Verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. I believe this pearl, this treasure, has a name. And on this walk of discipleship, we can make it so mechanical. Oh, it's the every nation thing we do. We follow, we fish, and we fellowship. Friends, it is so personal. It is a treasure, the greatest treasure that I cannot wait to one day when I'm not here anymore and I close my eyes and I open them up to look to those amazing eyes, hear them say, well, Galina, Lover of my soul, that is Jesus. That is my greatest treasure. That is what it means to follow him and to become like him on this road trip and him being my greatest destination. I end with the story as a story of choice. In the old days when Caesar became this mighty general in the Roman army, he would conquer all of the known world. And then the Senate in Rome would say that any general, when they returned to Rome with their army, at a certain river called the Rubicon River, and you'll see it on the map, entering from Gaul into Rome, Roman territory, from that river they had to stand down. They're not an army anymore. So that they can't usurp the Senate. But... Um, Caesar had different plans. And he had a moment at the Rubicon River where he cast some dies and said in Latin, alia jacta est, which means the die has been cast. The choice has been made. Once you cross this river, fellow soldiers, you are with me. Or you can stay behind. I believe today is a Rubicon River for you. I've had mine as a young man. I've had a couple of Rubicon moments where I again had to choose. But would you today make a choice to say, I am all in. I'll follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. He wore my sin. I'll gladly wear his name. He is the treasure. He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. Lord, thank you that us choosing you is just a response. You choosing us first and calling out to us. You giving your life away on that blessed wooden cross where you took our place and you became the substitute for our sin and our sinful nature. And now you're offering salvation to anyone who would repent and believe in the good news, the gospel of Jesus. As some people are watching this, they have a choice to make today. Would you burn in their hearts and call them to come and follow, not religion, not a set of rules, but you, a person, the most amazing, glorious Lord and Saviour. And if you want to choose that for the first time today, you just say, Jesus, in your heart, or out loud, you say, Jesus, I cannot save myself. I need a savior. I surrender to your Lordship. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I want to become more like you. Forgive my sin and come into my life. Come make me a new person. Maybe you've made this decision a long time ago. But you are on the fence. You do not daily choose the Lordship, follow him and to become more like him. And just tell him, Lord, I want to become more like you. More of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. Help me to follow you, to choose you daily. You are my greatest destination. Becoming more like you. Not just escaping hell. I want to become more like you. I want to fall in love with you. I want to 
glorify you with my whole life. That is what the discipleship is about. Following you. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Rati, for that profound message. Thank you for reminding us that it's not about the end destination, but the journey to the destination, the walk we have with Jesus, and that He should be our ultimate destination. And if you have made that decision today, I want to encourage you, get in touch with us. There is a link in the description below where you will be able to get connected with one of our church leaders. If you are maybe outside of the Pretoria region or even internationally based, I want to encourage you to get connected into your local church community. And with that said, I hope to see you again next week. And if you haven't done so yet, hit that like, subscribe and share this message. Goodbye.